Hello, everyone. We're going to talk about topic sentences, paragraph construction, intros and conclusions, and quotation hamburgers. I'm going to split it up, though, so we'll do some sections of, of things. So hopefully you can see this page of Evernote entitled Hamburger. It's really cold in my basement, so I might have to run to get a sweater. So these are the things that, when I was an undergrad, essentially changed my life when it came to writing. And I want to pass this along so that you can use it for revisions and the upcoming argument number three. So what does this look like? What does the pieces of a paragraph do? What do they do? So to begin, the goal of all writing is to help others see the truth that you see. That's why no matter what you're writing, everything is essentially an argument because you're trying to convince someone of your perspective and your point of view. So whether we're looking at advertisements, whether we're looking at a personal narrative or an argument about some kind of specific topic, you're all trying to convince someone else to see the things that you see that they don't necessarily see. So as an overarching philosophy with my writing, uh, a quote from my first composition professor is, you want your audience to stand where you stand and look where you look. And you do that through precise, clear, specific writing. And that's what we're gonna walk through the steps of. So topic sentences specifically are very necessary when it comes to that because that's how you break up your argument and your main ideas. So topic sentences create a box. And if the idea doesn't fit in the box, it doesn't fit in the paragraph. So what that looks like in this example of the hamburger is of all the elements that make up a great hamburger, the most important is the patty. What that means for the, the box is we're not talking about the price. We're not talking about the packaging. We're not talking about where it appears on the menu or even what the restaurant is. We're talking about specifically the patty, right? So we're limiting that focus of the paragraph to the patty. If we were going to talk about how, you know, a, a hamburger is, is made even better through great packaging, that's the next paragraph. You're not going to put those two things in there. Even if it's a compare and contrast, you're going to talk about how the patty is one element of a great hamburger and then the packaging is another element of a great hamburger. And you're going to stack those back and forth. And then once you split them up, maybe you could do a paragraph where it's, it, you know, it puts them against one another or something like that. So the topic sentence is a main idea and an opinion or a claim. And so I'll use a claim because I think that that's much more kind of a bolder language, right? You were, you were making the argument that the patty is the most important part. So it's not an opinion. It is, I'm going to argue this fact or this point and I'm going to prove it. So we're going to split this up like that. Sorry. So of all the elements that make up a great hamburger, the most important is the patty. Boom. Clear topic sentence. So what happens next? What is the actual next sentence that you should be writing? So you want to then, after your topic sentence, explain your topic sentence, right? So you want your, you want your audience to stand where you stand and look where you look. So you've already got them kind of in position, but never underestimate how important it is to keep explaining these things to get rid of all redundancies, any kind of misunderstandings that are possible. Sorry, I have the hiccups or something for some reason. So the next sentence, then you're kind of taking another swing at a topic sentence, but you're explaining some of the specific language. So although there are other key components, so kind of mimicking that writing of, of all the other elements, although there are other key components of a burger, the patty is the soul of the hamburger. So you're, you're again, restating it in a way that clarifies and removes all misunderstanding, uh, potential misunderstanding. So in a way you're rewriting it, in a way you're clarifying it, and in a way you're furthering that argument through another point. So you're furthering that claim. So that's what we call explaining your topic sense. Topic sense, explain your topic sense. Then after you feel you've explained it enough that there's no way that your audience can misunderstand what you're talking about, you're gonna start introducing evidence or proof. Why do we need proof? Well, as undergrads, you don't really have a lot of clout when it comes to what you're talking about, right? If you haven't been published, maybe you have, but most likely you've never been published. You're not an expert in the fields. 
you know, there's, you don't have ethos. You don't have any kind of reputation that uh, adds any kind of clout to your, to your ideas. So you bring in scholars, researchers, and experts, and it's their words that you bring into your writing to give yourself that kind of thing. So the proof is, in a way, <laughs> we're going to keep saying proof and proving a lot, but your proof is you're going to prove your topic sense. So if you're arguing that the patty is the most important part of, your, of a burger, your proof is the evidence that solidifies that claim. So in this paragraph, the evidence is we're going to talk about patties. So, and we're going we're gonna to come back around to how I set this up. So while interviewing our fellow omnivorous classmates, and keep in mind this paragraph was written to be kind of humorous. It was an exercise that we did breaking down these uh, elements back in undergrad. So while, the, while interviewing our fellow omnivorous classmates, four of the five described the ideal patty in detail. So you're kind of setting up this quote. Of the four, Cole described his dream patty while salivating. Again, there's the humor. Quote, the patty must be thick and larger than the bun. Close quote. This statement expresses the importance of the patty in the burger. So we're going to stop there. So it's a simple quote. You don't need multiple sentences. You can use the ellipses. And I don't even think it's formatted properly there. It probably should be like that, whatever. But you want your evidence to prove your topic sense. So if you're talking about the patty, if you're talking about the bun, whatever, you're, you're, the quote that you're going to pull out is going to address that element. And the way that it's set up is very specific, but again, we'll come back to it. So you introduce this quote, it reinforces the main idea, it reinforces your claim, and it is the proof for those things. Then you explain it. So in a way, the sentence that says, this statement expresses the importance of the patty in the hamburger, that's kind of one element of the explanation. You don't just want to say, you know, the, the patty is the soul of the hamburger, quote, what like the patty must be thick and larger than the bun close quote and we're going to talk about why that is but you want to keep explaining it again you want your audience to stand where you stand to look where you look you want to get rid of all kind of ambiguity and all that kind of stuff so you explain the quote this statement expresses the importance of the patty and the hamburger then you go on to say the patty as the biggest part of the hamburger represents the vital importance of, of the patty in the success of the hamburger so again you're explaining it you're introducing your own ideas at that point, you've, you've seen what uh, the experts say, then you can have kind of some kind of statement. So you keep explaining your topics or your, your proof enough that your audience will understand all the points and the reasoning why you chose it. Then once that's done, the conclusion sentence reinforces the main idea and then it links in the proof. So at this point, your claim that was your topic sentence should already be proven. And another element of that is you don't necessarily need one quote. Sometimes you can do three, sometimes you can do five. You need all the proof that you need to prove your topic sentence within this paragraph. So maybe, you know, this quote is we interviewed Cole. Maybe we would likewise pull something from Worth It, or we would pull something from an NW ad saying how their patties are really good. You do all that stuff, you explain all of them, you link them all together through your own language. Then when you go to conclude, you're reinforcing your proof with the main idea of the topic sentence. So based on the majority's preference, again, that's the, that's the proof, right? Four of the five, although we quoted Cole specifically, we conclude that truly the patty is the most indispensable factor of a great hamburger. So you're reinforcing the main idea that what makes up a great hamburger is the patty. The proof is that all these people likewise mention that the patty is really important. And then you end with that proof. You tie those things together. So you kind of set up a framework with the topic sentence of your own opinions. You use other scholars to prove those opinions. And then when you conclude, you're pulling the proof back to the main concept of the topic sentence. So you're, it's almost, is it, an, is it like this or is it like this? It would be, I think it's like this, right? You have a very specific topic sentence, you build out proof, and then as the proof comes back, you uh, make it more specific again for the conclusion. I think that's how it should go, right? Yeah, you want it specific on both ends of the paragraph. Okay, so that is paragraph construction. Cut, I need to move.
Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to stop the screen share. Right. What we are going to talk about now is introduction and conclusions and quotation hamburgers. We talked about this stuff through food a lot in undergrad, apparently. So we're going to start with quotations, I think that's what we'll do. So I need to find one. So this is the paper that I wrote my second semester of undergrad about a graphic novel and how it is the basically a good way to introduce reluctant readers into getting into reading. So when we're looking at um, quotations, you don't want to do what is called a quotation bomb, where you're going along and all of a sudden there's some quotation marks and then there's a citation and then you move along. You want to be able to set up your quotations so that it kind of is, is in the same way. You almost make a topic sense for your, <laughs> for your quotation. You explain it, you say it, you explain it, and then you conclude. So it's almost kind of this mini thing set up within a paragraph. So let's find a good example of this. So in this paragraph, the importance of a great protagonist um, in graphic novels is blah, 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 blah. So we go along, I'm explaining who the protagonist is, and then we're going to get to the quote. So Claire Snowball, that's the scholar. So you want to introduce who it is who has done work in teenagers' use of graphic novels states. So that's her ethos. Why is this person important? Why do they have any kind of stake in this argument? You need to explain that. So it could be, you know, Ronald McDonald. <laughs> we'll go back to the hamburger idea. Ronald McDonald, the, you know, whatever he is, not spokesperson, the mascot of this who eats a lot of hamburgers, talks about hamburgers in some sense, blah, blah, blah. You want to set it up so that you're essentially framing the quotation as to why it is important, and specifically in this paragraph. So Claire Snowball, who has done work in teenagers use of graphic novels, states, and that could be better. I could say she's a scholar at this university. She works for this organization, something like that. A little bit more uh, potent ethos. States, quote, they are willing to read when they find something they connect with, close quote, right? And then we did the year because that's the quotation style. So that's the quote. And then I explain it and I link it in this way. So if I'm talking about the protagonist, who's Joseph Manson or Joe Manson, and the quote is that teenagers are willing to read when they find something they connect with, I explain it by saying what elements of his character they can uh, relate to. So he's 13 years old. He has this kind of health challenge. He's being bullied. His dad's dead. All this kind of stuff that is venues for people to relate to. He has a pet. And if you heard a big bonk, that was my son falling upstairs. <laughs> um, so we keep going through. And then let's see if there's another one. Maybe not in this one. That looked like it was the only one there. So we'll actually, we'll go back to the hamburger one because that this one's set up pretty well so we give some kind of framework about how this comes about so while interviewing these people right we're setting up who they are their classmates four out of the five some kind of statistic logos i don't love statistics but you know you do what you can and then we quote one of them cole so this quotation hamburger is not effective because other than Cole being a student, you know, maybe he doesn't have that much stake or uh, ethos in this argument. So this one could definitely be better. But I think that the way that I explain this one afterwards is much better. This statement expresses the importance of a patty in the hamburger. That's a great explanation. Why is this quote being used? Tell the audience that. If you're citing something about the use of color in an ad, and this person quotes how red is really important, you can say, these words from this scholar explain that red being used in an article or in an advertisement has this effect. This effect is important in this ad because, and then you link it back to your topic sentence. What about, what about the use of color in this ad are you arguing? And why red specifically? You can do that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's not the one I want. 
Hold on, I went to the wrong window. Okay, and then, you, and you can do as many explanation sentences as necessary. So it expresses the importance of the patty. Great, the patty as the biggest part of the burger, of the hamburger represents the vital importance, right? And so that links back to Cole's, um, Cole's quotation is that the size of the, of the patty is kind of one of the elements that we argue. So it's the biggest part of the hamburger, it's the vital part, et cetera, et cetera. And you could do another one saying that, you know, the patty must be thick. Okay, well, so Cole in this sentence is talking about how it, it must be, you know, this much diameter, this much height. You could start to break that stuff down and work that into your argument as well, if that's the kind of route that you, that you want to choose. So basically what this is doing for your reader is again, getting them to stand where you stand and look where you look. You want your reader to know why you're using this specific scholar. Oh, so that, yeah, and this is the other part. So you don't wanna just be like, you know, professor whoever at this university states, you want to say this professor at this university who does research in this, who is an expert on this, who has done or ran this study, you want to preface it a little bit more about kind of how their expertise is connected to the subject. So, I mean, it's sufficient to say they're, you know, this professor at this university, an expert in nanobots says, but if you can get to the specifics and say an expert in nanobots who has ran studies about how nanobots are being used to rebuild tissue in the heart, and you're doing some kind of argument about that, perfect that's going to be really, really good. So it's that kind of uh, introduction that you want to your quote. Then you give the quote. And then when you explain it, you start linking back to, you know, they said this, this helps my argument this way, clarify it for the reader, reader so that they can understand what you are getting at. All right. Go back to All right, let's see, I'm gonna get rid of my image so that I can do there. Okay. So the last part of what we're gonna talk about is introduction paragraphs and conclusion paragraphs. So with the page limits that I'm giving out, they definitely don't need to be this big, but the essence of what introduction paragraphs and conclusion paragraphs do is essentially, <laughs> and this is why this stuff is really fascinating, they are topic sentences and concluding sentences of the entire paper. So you kind of get this like scale as you go through. A paragraph is essentially a micro argument that fits into the larger argument that is the whole paper and the structure should all kind of be the same. You want to introduce what you're talking about, you want to explain what you're talking about, you want evidence, you want to explain that evidence, and then you want to conclude. And literally that's all the same. So if a topic sentence is your main idea and your claim, an introduction paragraph is exactly the same. It's main ideas, you're, you're framing the argument and kind of the larger discourse of what you're talking about. You're making claims, you're including opinions, but the main thing that is different is that you're kind of preference, prefacing your proof. So let's look through this. So within the discourse of English exists an ongoing debate to determine how reluctant readers can become more motivated to utilize literature. So I'm linking into the discussions that are already going on within the field of English. One aspect of that debate is the idea of using graphic novels as a means to bridge the gap between indifferent readers and evocative literature. So again, here's the, where this main idea comes from. Graphic novels are already being talked about as a way to get people reading. The main idea of this whole thing is that graphic novels are gonna be this link, this bridge to get indifferent readers into more kind of canon literature, if you will. So then I illustrate the problem, and this is what I'm arguing. However, with a market vastly flooded with graphic novels, which are affected to help readers. So I don't love that. I would change that if I was writing this today, I wouldn't include the question, but it sets up an, an interesting way for me to say my thesis, which is that this paper answers that question through analyzing a graphic novel using the Hunsander model uh, sorry, well, it is the model, but the instrument of literature criteria. So then I explain what that is. Dr. Patricia Hunsander is an assistant professor in the College of Education at the University of South Florida and has published many studies concerning the qualities that graphic novels need to possess in order to be useful in aiding readers. So that's a lot of background. I could have done that in a different paragraph, but because I'm already talking about 
how, or I guess a more reputable way of judging uh, graphic novels. And this was the model that I found to, to do this paper. I wanted to set it up in the introduction so that I wouldn't have to keep coming back to it. So the problem is that how do we find graphic novels to get people reading? Well, the solution is the Hunsander model. Then I suggest, um, so I'm going to use the criteria, some criteria from that model specifically, and this is where I preview what I'm going to cover in the paper. I'm going to talk about character and development, vivid and interesting writing style, presentation of ethical and cultural values, and, and appealing illustrations. So this is essentially me saying, as you read this paper, you're going to see how I argue that character and development fits in with the Hunsander model, et cetera, et cetera, for all of them. And then after I talk, because I'm linking all that stuff together, right? I'm, I introduce who she is, what the model does, what elements of the model I use. And then this is kind of the more uh, specific thesis statement is this last chunk. So I demonstrate how the described criteria are found in Joe the Barbarian, the graphic novel that I'm arguing by Grant Morrison and Sean Murphy to make that book an ideal choice to motivate reluctant readers to explore more types of literature. So that's my thesis statement. And again, I use I, I don't really care. If you can make it work, make it work. We went back and forth all the time in undergrad classes about can you use it or not? If you can make it work, then make it work. So the audience knows that there's an ongoing debate in English. There's a problem that exists. This paper addresses the problem. They know how it addresses the problem by using the Hunt Center model. They know what specific elements of the model I talk about. And then they know the book. And the goal is that it's a book or that I'm going to argue that the book is an ideal choice to get reluctant readers motivated into exploring different types of literature. So it's almost like here's the topic sentence. And then I explain it. This is the proof. And then I explain the proof by talking about the criteria. And then I conclude by saying, I'm going to use that criteria and the main idea of which graphic novel do we use? This is the solution. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. And then I'll, I'll quickly go through. So we talk about character in this first paragraph, the importance of a great protagonist. And then there's all my explanation. The script, right? A vivid and engaging writing style. The script of it is really good. We talk about it's effective for young readers because the plot of the book addresses ethical and cultural situations. So you want to keep copying that language as well. And so if up here in the introduction, I talk about the presentation of ethical and cultural values. And then down here, I say it addresses personal and meaningful situations there's not that connection there you want to mimic that language all the way through you want to copy those kind of key phrases so that the introduction right you have kind of a a link all the way through so then i talk about that and i'm keeping it in the same order as well which is why you should be writing your introduction paragraph last because you don't know what course of action or course of, not course of action, what course of development your writing is going to take as you're writing it. If you write your introduction first, you're locked in. And that's really problematic because maybe a great idea comes up, but because you've already written your introduction paragraph, you either dis discard it, or if you include it, you have to go back and rewrite it. So I would say when you're outlining, have, you know, have the skeleton of where you want to go, write that, write your conclusion, and then go back and write your introduction. So then we talk about the art and I include some art. Yep. <laughs> and then here's the conclusion paragraph. So based on the criteria for an effective graphic novel, I'm going to have to sneeze. Graphic novel as stated in the Hunsatter model here. We okay. There might be one more. Based on the criteria for an effective graphic novel as stated in the Hunsatter instrument, so that's all stuff that comes before, Joe the Barbarian should be considered as an effective graphic novel to encourage reluctant readers to be more engaged with the literature. So basically, I'm restating my thesis statement. Joe the Barbarian is effective. Why? Because it matches all these things that come from this model that I'm using. Then, in a way, here is you use all the proof to prove your topic senses. Joe is a great round dynamic protagonist. 
that satisfies the first point. The script written by Grant Morrison creates an engaging and interesting story. Boom, second point. The plot of the book deals with cultural and ethical issues. Boom. Sean Murphy and Dave Stewart, who's the colorist, present an artistic side of the story as appealing scenes to interest readers, right? So remember all those things we talked about. I was gonna argue how character, script, cultural and ethical issues, and the art style are all reasons why this graphic novel is effective. And I just reminded the reader, hey, we talked about Joe being a great character. The script was really engaging. The plot of the book deals with these things and the art style is very appealing. You remind them. So you're, again, you're proving that the proof that you talked about proves the main idea. This is how all this stuff fits in here. These elements, this is the last claim. These elements satisfy the Hun Satter instrument and separate Joe the Barbarian, which should be italicized. I was, I was not worried about form. From the rest of the graphic novels on the market, right? So you're creating that distinction. This is proving that first claim, right? The question, what, what graphic novels do we use? This, you use this one. That's the, the claim that happens in the conclusion sentence. And then you end, thus reluctant readers who read Joe the Barbarian will want to explore more literature and become engaged in reading. So it's all those kind of problems and situations that were introduced in the introduction. You've proven all of the criteria and steps that you do throughout the paper and in the conclusion, you remind the reader about what they read. You remind them, yes, this is how these pieces satisfy the argument or the claim that I introduced in the introduction paragraph. And, you know, sometimes it's a call to action. Sometimes it's just you reminding it again. So I say they satisfy it. That could have been enough, but I wanted to really hammer it home again, mimicking that language I used before. Those who read it will want to explore more literature and become engaged in reading, which mimics that thing of how do we get them more engaged in reading if they're reluctant and that kind of stuff. So again, the conclusion paragraph overviews what you talked about. It proves the proof once again, you explain it a little bit more, and then you essentially say, this is how all the things I talked about proves my thesis statement. This is how it all works. And that's how it works. And then you have your citations. So hopefully that was really helpful. Hopefully it was helpful to some degree. Again, this stuff I think is important when you're revising. You have the ideas on paper. And for me, I think of writing a lot as Lego. It's just pieces, it's just blocks. You just have to have them in the right order to be most effective. So when you're going through and you are revising or you're writing from scratch, if this is assignment three that you're starting, think about these things. Think about this order, topic sentences, explain your topic sentences, preview your proof, prove, explain your proof, explain your proof again if you need to, and then conclude by revising or by revisiting the, the main idea of the topic sentence and then the proof. And it goes the exact same for introduction introduce some kind of problem or situation that your argument fits or solves, outline what you're gonna talk about. And so this is why in those one page papers, it was really tricky and why your introductions and conclusions were really short. If you're only talking about one thing, right? If you're just talking about color in this ad, you don't need to go on this huge thing. You can have it be very specific as long as you very clearly state, I'm going to talk about color and color in this argument or in this advertisement has blank effect, right? Boom really effective. You don't need to preview a whole bunch of other stuff other than that. So I am going to let you take this on and uh, I hope to see some things come up in peer reviews and your own writing. I hope that it's a great experience with this going forward. Um, yeah. This stuff was really helpful for me and I hope that it's really helpful for you in the same, the same aspects. If you have any questions about it, if you, if there's something that I didn't quite explain well enough, please reach out. I'm more than willing to do a zoom meeting with you if you want or whatever way uh, so I can explain it in real time and not through email. Please just let me know what you need. I want these last few assignments and especially the revision to be really good and really helpful. Because again, I think it is revision where true writing happens. So take what you can from all this stuff and let me know if it's effective or if you need a little bit more because I'm very willing to help out with that. So thank you and good luck.